Today we're talking about AI, chat GPT, that kind of thing, and whether or not you should use it in your programming education. Welcome back everybody, it's good to be back today. We're talking about a topic that a lot of you have requested that is AI or large language models, generative AI, chat GPT, that kind of stuff. It seems like the new wunderkind or boogeyman of the computing world. It's got people predicting the end of our field, end of programming as we know it. It's also got a lot of students wondering, am I gonna have a job when I graduate? And a lot of computing students are using it to try to get it to do their work for them. And that's causing a lot of consternation, a lot of discussion among faculty members. Numbers. And I do think you're going to see programming education evolve a bit because of it. But so while we're all taking deep breaths, calming down, telling ourselves it's going to be okay, because it probably is, today I want to give a couple of reasons why you should really think twice before using generative AI in your programming education, your programming projects. But first, a huge thank you to all of you who support this channel through Patreon and buying merch and other ways of supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. For those of you that are new to the channel, you can get access to source code and my monthly monthly office hours through Patreon. But now let's talk about language models and ChatGPT. Now, first of all, I want to make it really clear that I don't think it's evil. I don't hate ChatGPT. I don't think it's the one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. I think it's a useful tool that is gonna be used for good at times, and at times is gonna be annoying and maybe even destructive, just like most technologies. So anyway, reason number one is that ChatGPT is often wrong. As I hear people talk about ChatGPT, it becomes very apparent for many of them that they actually believe it is intelligent. We humans tend to find things that speak or communicate fluently as more convincing than things that don't. So when something is able to put together a string of words that sounds like they are fluent in our language, we tend to be like, ah, that's very convincing. I believe that's true, or I believe that's intelligent. And then of course, ChatGPT is right some of the time, sometimes a lot of the time, and that can make things worse because then you believe it even more. And rather than just say this, let's let's look at a specific example, okay? Let's jump into some code. So I'm teaching an embedded systems class this semester, so I thought I would ask ChatGPT to generate an example for me. And we're using energy in the class, Yes, I know it's no longer maintained. No, I probably won't be using it in the future, but I'm using it now. So I asked ChatGPT to give me an example of how to use the MSP430 FR5994's low power modes in the Energia framework. So using the Energia software framework. And I wanted to use a button to wake up the microcontroller. So having some kind of interrupt or interrupt service routine. And as always, ChatGPT spit me out some example code and I wanna look at it. So this is the code that it generated and in short, it's a mess. It's wrong, it doesn't work, and any human with a passing understanding of the topic will be able to tell that no student learning energy wrote this. Also, in the interest of full transparency, I had to generate three different programs using the same prompt, and each was wrong in a different way. None came close to a working solution, this just happened to be the one that I picked. So let's go through it really quick and look. First of all, this header file, not necessary. Now this next part, I'm tempted to forgive because I didn't really tell it what pin my button's attached to. In this case, uh, I'm actually using the button on 5.5, so that's fine. But yeah, we they at least were smart enough to say modify it to a different pin. But I'm actually not gonna forgive this, I think, because this is not how we specify our pins in Energia, right? It would be something like this. P5 underscore five would be how we would specify pin 5.5. I mean, we could do it the way this example is showing, but we're basically fighting energy all along the way, which is essentially what this example, basically the whole example is fighting energy and doing it in ways that is either going to break energy or just not work in the way that energy is designed to work. Okay, so if we move on down here, you don't need this part, right? In fact, this is going to be a problem. This is going to break a lot of energy as functionality. Most of energy as timing related code uses the watchdog timer. So if we just stop it right here, things are just not gonna work well. So this is not a good idea to put at the beginning of your setup function. And then this next section here, I mean, this is all wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's not all wrong. In fact, some of this might even actually work, but it's the point is it's not the right way to do this in Energia. It's not how we typically do this in Energia. This is more like how we would do things if we were not using Energia and we were just using GCC and just writing bare metal C code. The more typical way to do this in Energia would be we could just basically take this whole bit here and replace it with something like pin mode uh, button because we've already defined that up there and then input pull up because my button has a pull up resistor on it or needs to be pulled up. What this is going to do is it's 
gonna basically make the default state for the button high, and then when I push the button, it's gonna go low. But so there, that one call basically does what all those lines of code were doing. That brings me down to this next line, which like, yeah, we don't need this either because energy is gonna do this for us already. We can get rid of that. And then we come down here to this line. This is where it's actually trying to go into low power mode four. That is almost the lowest low power mode that the uh, MSC430 has. It's basically trying to update the processor status register saying, I want to go into LPM4 and I want global interrupts enabled. That's this GIE. And while I appreciate the comments to tell us what this is doing, this is actually not going to work because Energy does a bunch of stuff. It's basically doing a bunch of stuff under the hood that's gonna cause this call right here to not go into low power mode, right? This is not gonna go into LPM4. Instead, it's going to wake up or it's gonna go into a different low power mode and then it's gonna wake up immediately and then it will jump down in a loop and basically spin in this loop full of no ops forever. So it's not gonna wait for the button to be pressed, which is what I wanted. Okay, so this right here, this is also gonna have to go. It's just, it's, it's wrong. I'm gonna just comment it out for now. We'll come back and fix it later. And then let's also look down here at this interrupt service routine. This is also just, again, not helpful. There is an alternate universe where this might work. You notice it's toggling a pin that we didn't even set up up above. So it's like, like it's gonna blink a light, but you know, did we put it in output mode? No, so that's not gonna work. But the bigger problem is, is that Energia has its own port interrupt handlers. And so by just trying to redefine the port five vector ISR, that's probably gonna cause some serious problems under the hood for Energia. It's basically gonna replace a bunch of Energia's code. We might get compile errors, but we're definitely gonna cause some runtime problems. Okay, so let's finish. We kind of been fixing as we go, but let's just finish this up. Instead, I'm gonna replace this with an actual Energia style ISR. So we're gonna say void, let's call it button ISR. It takes no arguments. Okay, so this is what our ISR is gonna look like. And then up here, we need to tell Energia that we actually want it to be called. So we're gonna call attach interrupt, and we'll say we want button, the function we want it to call. So it's the pin, the, but the function we wanna call, and then falling because I want it to be called when the pin goes from high to low. So the falling edge, I want that to be when we call it. Okay, now the other thing that was lame about this example is it doesn't really give us any way of knowing whether this thing actually works, right? If it works or doesn't work, if you don't go into LPM4, you would not know the difference from looking at this. So that's kind of lame, I'm not loving that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this code, the, the actual go to sleep, and I wanna move it down into loop, okay? So here, where we'd say, we're gonna go to sleep. But instead of trying to set the status register directly, what we're gonna do is it turns out that there's a function called suspend that's provided by Energia. Now in ChatGPT's defense, this function is an undocumented API call. So I didn't even know this existed until I went dredging through the source code, but hey, ChatGPT is supposed to be smart, right? If it's intelligent, if it understood code, it could uh, probably even faster than me look through the code and figure out that this function was available. But we'll give it a break because it's not in any of the energy of documentation. But anyway, suspend is the right way to do this. And then down here in my button ISR, I need to also call wake up. Now what this does is basically it puts the thing to sleep. So we're gonna go to sleep right here. So we're gonna go to sleep, go into LPM4. Loop is just going to freeze right there. It's not gonna proceed to do anything else until down here, whenever the button ISR is called, because we push the button, then that's going to wake up. It'll resume from suspend and we'll come down here. And now instead of no operation, let's actually do something so you can see that it's working. So there's a bunch of things I could do here. Uh, let's just, let's send a message to the over the USB. So up here, we'll just say serial.begin. We'll use the default baud rate of 9600, though we could use whatever we wanted. And then serial.println button woke me up. Okay, and so now that should compile now, we should be good. And you can see we have a much simpler example and this one's actually gonna work. And just to make sure, cause we always wanna make sure it actually works, let's try and just install it, taking its time. And then if we come up here, we push that button and you can see every time I push the button, I mean, you can't see me pushing the button right now, but every time I do, you can see that it says button woke me up. Okay, so my test program, it works as intended. Okay, so great. So we finally got here, we got something that works and that's great and it's not too bad, but that's just because I knew what it was supposed to look like and because I've used Energia a fair amount and I'm 
fairly well versed in the MSV430 and how to write code for it. If on the other hand, I was new to programming, let's say I was in an embedded systems class just getting started on this and I was learning Energia for the first time or learning microcontroller programming for the first time, if any of those things were true, ChatGPT's help would not have been helpful. It would have totally messed me up. And of course, some of you are gonna say that I set ChatGPT up to fail, which I did. I mean, this is a real example from a real class that I'm really teaching right now, but it is definitely a niche prompt, right? If I had asked it to write me a simple for loop, it's probably gonna have a better track record. It's probably gonna be successful at writing that simple for loop, much more so than when I ask it to use some unmaintained framework that has a far smaller user base on some obscure microcontroller that just not a lot of people are playing with. But I guess that also makes my point, is someday when you get a job, the job that someone's gonna hire you to do is not likely to be the thing that is super easy that everybody can do. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that ChatGPT is cool, but it's not Skynet, thankfully. Hopefully it never gets there. Hopefully we're smart enough to stop before we get there. But more importantly, it doesn't understand what it's saying. It's simply mimicking the training data that it was trained on. So that's reason number one. Now, reason number two is that heavy ChatGPT usage is almost certainly going to make you a weaker programmer. Now, recently I've heard a lot of people talk about generative AI as like the next calculator, like these tools that everybody has to learn and they're like, you gotta make sure you teach those students how to use it effectively. And look, calculators are great, but the people who say this about math and calculators and how important it is to teach students calculator skills, most of them are not that strong mathematicians. At least that's been my experience. And yes, I do think that generative AI tools can be a powerful tool, can be very useful in the hands of a skilled developer. That is a developer who can and will keep their eyes on what actually is getting spit out. They understand the code well enough to be able to identify nonsense that comes out of it. And hopefully they're also keeping an eye on some of the legal murky areas involved with generative AI. But back to math, you notice that you don't hear people saying, wow, that person's a brilliant mathematician. Too bad they don't know how to use a calculator. Now, the reason for that is that, first of all, calculators aren't that hard to learn, and which neither is ChatGPT. But learning to think mathematically is more challenging. And of course, you also notice that a lot of your math classes will have times where they say you can't use a calculator or try not to use a calculator. Or the point is they're trying to discourage you from using a calculator because it can easily become a crutch. And that's really what I'm trying to say, is that for programmers, ChatGPT can easily become your new crutch. Because you're training yourself to become a skilled developer, you're training your brain, your mind to think in a new way, and if you're outsourcing that work, you know, those projects that you're being asked to do, hopefully are there to train you, to give you repetitions, to teach you how to problem solve, to teach you how to do things. That's training your brain to work in a different way. If you're not doing that, if ChatGPT is doing that, well, you're not getting the education that you're paying for. And then of course, heaven help you when you reach my class or any other class where you actually have to think about hard problems, when the projects you're working on become complex enough, the chat GPT doesn't know what it's doing, or when you finally get a job and someone asks you to do something really challenging that's worth your salary, because that's when you're gonna find out just how stupid chat GPT is. It can't solve new problems, at least not very well. It's good at mimicking old problems or well-worn problems, but it's not a replacement for really understanding what you're doing. And I know it's tempting. You find yourself right up against a dead line and you're like, ah, do I have, to, I don't have time for this. I got to get this done. I got to get this grade, whatever. Just stop. Before you get to that point, give yourself enough time. Do it right. Do it yourself. You will thank yourself later. So anyway, no, ChatGPT is not Skynet. No, it is not intelligent. In fact, the thought of it being actually intelligent is a little frightening. Hopefully we never get to that point. And hopefully you have the sense to leave ChatGPT on the shelf, mostly until you're skilled enough to not need it. And then it can become really useful. So thanks everyone for being here. Click something on your way out and I'll see you in the next one.